Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Uh, I want to uh, say a special thank you to everybody who became one of our friends on Facebook. We crossed the 1,000 mark just one day shy of the show's second anniversary of our first regular podcast. So thanks so much. I uh, appreciate everybody and appreciate our listeners' fantastic support. Thank about, and of course, today's episode of Let George Do It is brought to you by our listeners' financial support. Thank you so much. Today's episode is called 11 O'Clock. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Standard Oil Company of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Eleven o'clock, another adventure of George Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Estella, who's Mr. Valentine? Hey, book of the month, unglue yourself. I said, who's Mr. Valentine? How should I know he's a man? Just like that, she says it. Oh, don't talk like a girl's college, Maggie. (laughs) This is your alma mater, dear, not mine. I don't know how you stand it. Oh, I don't mean it hasn't been nice for summer session, but... For an aging school teacher like me... I know, I know. Give you a handy football team every time. You're like all the rest of the man happies around this place. I just wondered why I was coming here, that's all. I don't know. Friend of my uncle's, I guess. Be here this morning. And Valentine, somebody named Miss Brooks. I don't know, just coming. I thought you had a class this morning. Educational Psych 110. Oh, I don't know how you stand all that garbage. Leave your mind alone, I say. Your mind's for wearing hats on, not hocus pocus and... Psychology 110. Hey, that's Ferris, though, isn't it? Yeah, the teeth. Seen my scarf anywhere? Estella, why don't you tell me what goes with him and that blonde drawl down the hall? Not interested. Who cares? Women never talk about it. Oh, I know they can't stand him, but you know, don't you? The girls always tell you things. And somebody said they go horseback riding together, and he's married, too. Did you know that? I mean, Vicky the blonde was an undergraduate here herself, wasn't she? So you ought to know. What's the big secret, anyway? What's with this guy, Ferris? What's so mysterious about Maggie, him? what time is it? Hmm? Oh, 11 o'clock. Where are you going? 11 o'clock. Aren't you going to wait for Mr. Valentine? I must go someplace. Well, hey, at least take your books for you. 11.30. Estella, what's the matter with you? I don't want to see Mr. Valentine. There's too much to do. I'm not going to class. What? Oh, listen, you never missed a class in your life. Estella! Let go of me. But you look sick. Oh, I always said you worked too hard. I promised her I wouldn't tell. I promised the other... Honey, wait a minute. No. No, I'm going. I have to go. Ferris told me to. What? Goodbye, Maggie. It's still in the go! <laughs> oh, that girl's not going to live very long. It was my car, Mrs. Ferris. We almost hit her. But what does that have to do with me? We didn't know who it was at the time. We weren't going fast, Crazy but kid that... didn't even look up. Afterwards, she just kept on walking. In fact, she ran. I yelled at her, but she wouldn't stop. Oh, well, that's Estelle. Estelle? Estella. Blair is her last name. Oh. Oh, yes. And somebody wrote to you about her, Mr. Valentine? Her uncle, Mrs. Ferris. I explained that to you. I wanted to see your husband, the professor, about it, but you... Oh, well, he's in class. Good heavens, there are so many in summer session. Some of his classes are 70 and 80, regular tent shows. 
And in psychology, too, the poor thing. Now, look, Mrs. Ferris, it was this Estella's roommate who suggested we come right over here, a girl named Maggie. Well, I don't... Miss Maggie was scared to death about her. She's out looking for her now. She can't find her. She said Estella suddenly started acting so strangely and ran out saying that your husband had told her to go someplace. (laughs) I can't imagine where. Or maybe she meant she told my husband to go someplace. Oh, look here, Mr. Valentine, I really don't understand what you're doing. Okay, okay, here, take a look. Oh, later. Oh, oh, the uncle. Uh, Dear Mr. Valentine, would appreciate it if you dropped by to see my niece, Estella Blair. I'm her guardian and now too busy to see her very often. But I've been worried the way she's acted lately, her last few visits. She's finished studying for her degree at summer session at, uh... Well, (laughs) that makes it so clear. Some sort of a woman's counselor, are you? Dorothy Dick? Oh, I'm afraid now I'm really baffled. Mrs. Ferris, I talked to her uncle on the phone. He's worried about the girl because he feels she's hiding something. Something to do with your husband, Professor Ferris. Oh, excuse my underestimating you. You do go straight to the point, don't you? You think this girl and my husband... So you come to me. Well, come in, come in. Like some iced tea? Awfully hot. I'd give you something cooler if I thought you wouldn't tell. No, thanks. You're wrong, Mrs. Ferris. Nobody thinks that at all. If we did, we wouldn't be so tacky. If you'd seen the girl, I'm sure you wouldn't. (laughs) I remember her now. A little too dull, I'm afraid, for the teeth. The teeth? That's what the girls call my husband. You know, the teeth. He smiles so beautifully. And at everyone. No... No, I understand you're worried and blunt because you think the next car might not stop as quickly as yours did. You almost killed the girl and you think she's still in danger and outlawed something. And we want to know about her fast. Well, it's a logical enough conclusion, though. Thinking of my husband that way. Every girl in college is always in love with him, you know. But you just picked the wrong girl, that's all. Now, if it had been a red-headed research student named Mrs. Sarah Jensen who keeps his notes for him, bless her heart... The night... Look, look, Mrs. Ferris. No, you look. I'm not just talking. I think you should know that my husband and I don't have much in common except assistance. If it weren't inconvenient, we'd be separated. So none of what I'm talking about means anything to me. My husband is a perfectly harmless research psychologist. In love with nothing but his deep, dark work. And that's quite all right with me. This is the way I stole gossip, you see. I tell people first. But... But did all this happen about 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock? Well, yes, in a way. Estella ran out of the dormitory at 11. Started acting strangely then. Just what do you mean, Mr. Ferris? Well, I don't quite know. But there is something peculiar. I don't mean the Cecile Jensen I spoke of, but... You see, the campus stables are right up the lane from here. And another girl, Vicky, who goes riding sometimes with my husband, is quite innocent, really. Oh, I know this is so confusing. There are so many women around. Well, go on, go on. What was it you started to say? George, listen. Well, um, just that this other girl besides your Estella was cutting my husband's class, too, at 11.30. I met her on the sidewalk. She had a job to her down, just looked right past me, but... But she said, very quietly, she wasn't going to tell. She was... Riding. Look, George, it's an ambulance. Riding. It's going up the lane, Mr. Valentine. The stables. Hurry! Out this way. It was Vicky, Mrs. Ferris, that blonde girl. It goes riding with the professor, you know the one. It was the square nose that threw her. Calm down, will you calm down? Just tell me what happened. They don't even know whether she's going to live or not. Oh, she took a terrible spill. She was thrown, mister, don't you understand me? By one of my gentlest horses, too. I, I, I thought it was funny, Mrs. Ferris, when she came here this time of day, but she said she had to go riding because it was 11 o'clock. Okay. Now, I told you, Mr. Valentine, that's what she said to me. And what a fellow said... All right, all right. Oh. Come here, friend. Come here. Hmm? Now, which horse was it? Uh, the square nose. He came galloping in by himself. I called an ambulance. All right, I... never mind, never mind. Just stop shaking, will you? You've seen riding accidents before. 
Now, what's the rest of it? The, the, well, it's just that I... I don't know what I should do, mister. Who I should call. Uh, I well, mean... What do you mean, call? Hey, well, here. This strap holds the cinch. Now, uh, that girl, that Vicky, she always saddles up herself. Ha has her own stuff. She's a good rider, too. Yeah. But... But anybody would have been thrown with this. See? Yeah, yeah, I see. The strap's been cut. Cut halfway through. Yeah. Then it broke the rest of the way, I suppose, when the horse galloped. Yeah, that's what I figure, sir. Well, I, I mean, what should I do? She came here and she said, Professor Ferris told me to go riding at 11 o'clock. What? Only, only it looks more like somebody wanted to kill her at 11 o'clock. <laughs> It's so confusing, so many women around. But somehow they all seem to be tied up together, George. You mean tied up with the same guy, Brooksy, in the same time. And Estella, George. She did all the same things and said all the same things that this girl... Okay, get the police. They can find her fast in the weekend. George... Me? I got a date with a professor right now. Perhaps I should go on the stage. But of course, an educational class... Uh, excuse me. What is this uh, is Psychology 110, isn't it? Such as isn't that Professor Ferris? It is Ferris? hypnosis I wish to Look, demonstrate. I said, that excuse me. You Look, young lady, it can't be that fascinating. Yes. Of what oh, I see. The center stage seems to be up this way, doesn't it? Or is it you they're all staring at, Miss... Uh... Jensen. Jensen? As I Cecilia, think, you're excuse me. Oh, wait a minute, sure, but... Are you visiting uh, me, Susan? I'm sorry, I have Jensen to leave early. Excuse me? Because she's heard the chimes, hasn't she? The 12 o'clock chime? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there she goes. Where are you going, Cecile? Miss Jensen? The redhead. I'm sorry, Professor, but I have to leave early. Oh, but we were talking about hypnosis, Miss Jensen. <laughs> I had some very interesting things to say about things people can be made to do through hypnosis. I know. Forgive me, sir, but I must go now. It's quite all right, really. Ferris told me. <laughs> Ferris told me. All right, ladies, I guess we're a success. Those words were given to her yesterday. Class dismissed. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute there. Demonstration is all over, young man. Oh, no, it's not, friend. Okay, let me get by. Will you excuse me, girl? I guess we've scared another visitor, ladies. I'll reassure you, sir. There's nothing to be frightened of. You've only stumbled into a very ordinary demonstration of posted... Yeah, power. where'd you send that girl? Uh, Miss Jensen? Oh, she won't even leave the building. It's only a joke. You see, a person can't be hypnotized into doing anything really dangerous or against his nature. She said Ferris told me to. Now, that's you. And that's what the others said. So you do all this hypnotizing stuff, of huh? Of course. It's part of our classwork in psychology. Did you, uh, hypnotize Estella Blair, too, and a blonde girl named Vicky? Well, naturally. Suggestions, really. Under hypnosis, I give them suggestions uh, on what they should do, you see, at 11 o'clock. For heaven's sake, young man, there's nothing to be alarmed about. They don't know why, but they do what I tell them, that's all. <laughs> and why those particular girls? Well, in demonstrations like this, I've given hypnotic suggestions to practically every woman in this class. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. When you get in your car and start out for the high mountain country, make sure your car's engine has the extra protection of RPM motor oil. Those long, winding, steep grades mean extra work for your engine. A good chance for carbon to clog up rings and valve stems. But you can avoid carbon trouble by using RPM. First choice where driving's toughest. It's specially compounded to prevent carbon formations, and that's why folks will tell you more people prefer RPM than any other motor oil. RPM also prevents the corrosion caused by acid-laden moisture, sticks to engine hot spots, and stops sludge trouble. In fact, it's the best engine insurance you can buy. So wherever you motor in the West, ask for RPM. First choice where driving's toughest. Ask for it at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Back to 
to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Eleven o'clock, and Estella, the girl you came to this women's college campus to visit, walked out of her dormitory and disappeared. At eleven o'clock, too, another girl, Vicky, a blonde, strangely decided to go horseback riding. And now Vicky is in a hospital because she was thrown from her horse. Only her saddle had been tampered with. Someone wanted to kill Vicky. Well, you found that there's a quite a simple explanation for 11 o'clock for the girls' strange behavior. They were part of a demonstration in Professor Ferris' psychology class. And if your name is George Valentine, what you want to explain is attempted murder. But what has actually happened, Mr. Valentine? A cut strap, that's all. I can't believe there's any connection. Why, this little exhibition of mine, there's nothing to it. Yeah, post-hypnotic suggestion, you call I ask for volunteers. The whole class sees it. They all want to get in on it. I hypnotize the subject, tell her to do something the next day. Now, that's the only difficult part of the time. But after I've instructed her, I wake her up. She doesn't know what she's been told to do. But then the next day, when she hears the chimes, that's the cue I use, the campus chime. Eleven o'clock. Exactly. Then the subject is seized with a desire to do what I have previously told her. She still doesn't know why. Of course, she's not in a trance or anything. She simply does it. Post-hypnotic suggestion. Of all oh, now, now, please listen to me. You can't instruct a person to do a harmful thing, to commit murder, for instance. It can't be done. But you sent that girl, Vicky, straight away. I away. told Vicky to go riding at 11, that's all. She wasn't in a dream. She had all her faculties. What did you tell yes. Estella to do? Oh, well, I, uh... Oh, I have notes on all the suggestions I gave. Uh, merely to cut the class, I think. I noticed that girl had never missed one before, and so it occurred to me a little vacation. I'll take didn't... it from your notes, thank you. At one at twelve o'clock, you said she was only to stand up and walk out just now, as she did. Oh, Cecile, the redhead. Come on, quickly. What? I'll show you. Oh, no, no, nothing is going to happen to her. Better not, Buster. Yeah, just a couple of rooms down. A few of the girls are still there. I'll show you what sinister <laughs> things I tell them to do. <laughs> She's putting water in a bucket. You worried about the flowers, Cecile? Well, they need a little water, don't you think? <laughs> Look at her. Hey, what's this all about? She's what going to water some flowers. Paper flowers, if you look closely. Paper flowers? And she doesn't know why she's doing it? She won't question it until it's over? Oh, this is very, very funny. Yes, yeah, but you see, I'd scarcely send anyone to the brink of a precipice. Okay, okay. So let's see the others, those notes. Of course. I have them right here. Some place. Oh, yes, here we are. Naturally, I want to take every precaution, but I assure you that Cecile's case there is a typical example of the symptom. Why, did, did you see it? What happened? She just poured the water. Look at her face. Madonna, Madonna, get away from there. She's dead. Her face is dead. I'll get it. Stand back, will you? Hey, get that I, I, flower I, I, fly. There we are. What in heaven's name? Oh, I, I, he can still save her. Call the fire department. Get a pull motor, quick. Why well, don't you stand there? She poured water on the flowers, didn't you see? But look what was hidden in the middle of them. A live electric wire. Almost all the class, that demonstration, almost all of them. Cecile will live, won't she? Electric shock is not always... Come on, the rest of them, I said. Uh, Miss Duval. No, 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 we've got to her already. Uh, Miss Perkins, she's gone somewhere by now. I tried to throw it out, sir. Oh, oh, good Lord, Valentine, I can't... The rest of them, I, I said... Now we're sure somebody's using your harmless demonstration for murder. Well, we found three girls doing somersaults in the lawn, sir. Two others went out by the lake someplace. Oh, they got a doctor, another one of them fancy birds. He claims he can help on snapping from that suggestion thing. Now, uh, there's another girl went out for a walk someplace. And the ones who'd already left the class for lunch are scattered all over. <laughs> George, look at this. What is it, Brooksy? Just a handkerchief, but I think it might explain... Get the explanations. There are 14 girls still unaccounted for. But, George, it's Estella's handkerchief. It was right in here, George. I didn't realize whose it was until that Maggie girl told me... Yeah, it's a funny place to come walking, though. Brush, tall weeds. Maggie saw Estella take this handkerchief with her purse when she left the dormitory. Professor Ferris insists he just told Estella to cut the back. A shot. It was over this way, Brooksy. Well, it was coming. Right, there she is. Hey, Estella. It's all right. Hey, Estella. Hey, hey, kids, slow down. We're not going to hurt you. That shot. Where did it come from? Who are you? Who are you? My name's Valentine. Now, you're not hurt, are you? No. Val- Mr. Valentine, you're coming to see me. You're... 
You're a friend of my uncle. Oh, the poor kid was scared to death, George. Yeah. Shot with a shot. I, I went for a walk, didn't I? Who was it, Estella? Somebody shot at you. Who was it? I don't know. I, I don't know. Come on, come on. Let's get out of here. The other way, George. It's only a short distance to the lane where the... My... Yeah, I see what you mean. The riding stable. What? Come on, kid. You'll be all right. George, I meant it's right near the Ferris house. <laughs> Oh, you found her. That's Miss... Uh... Uh, Stella Blair, Professor Ferris. Oh, of course. Well, where on earth have you... you get on the phone? Tell the sergeant. All right, George. Come on now. Sit down, kid. I'm all right. Well, young lady, we've been pretty worried, you know. We've... we've... I'm thought... perfectly all right. My uncle sent Mr. Valentine to see me. Oh! Well, hello, Charlotte. Oh, I was just... Uh... Mr. Valentine, yes. Yes, yes, that's right, Mrs. Ferris. We found her. Oh. Well, I, I was outside, you know. I've been looking for you, too, Estelle. I... I thought I heard something out there. Yes, I don't doubt it. I'll get you something, my dear. Wouldn't you like to like it? Oh, Charlotte, Miss Blair is perfectly... Oh, you old. are smart, Alex. Show off tricks. What? So much fun telling all these poor girls what to do. Charlotte. Listening to them laugh at your wonderful Heaven demonstrations. Say, please. The big smiling teeth. What? Where were you a few minutes ago? Charlotte, now stop it. And this is the girl they tell all their secrets to. I know. I've been finding out things oh, cut today. cut it out. Cut it out. Cut it out, both of you, will you? Eleven o'clock. Eleven o'clock. It was a legitimate demonstration, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine came to see me. Oh, look at her. Look what he's done to her. Stella. She's still hypnotized. Don't be ridiculous. It doesn't work that way. Works any way you want it to, doesn't it? Of course not. Now, look at me, young lady. It was only for a few moments yesterday, Valentine, when the suggestions were given. I'm perfectly all right. Well, my dear, there's no possible reason for... No, really, I am. I I just... Then why can't you look at me? Perhaps I'd better see her for a few moments alone, Valentine. Miss Blair... Did you hear that? Did you? I'll tell you what I meant a minute ago, Mr. Valentine. I'll see you alone for a few minutes. Oh, for Wait a minute. Go on, Mrs. The Harris. magic word. Oh, I don't mean he does anything, that he isn't a beautiful moral specimen. It's his ego that gets petted. And maybe their imaginations, every I'm one sorry, of them... I'm sorry, but I will not stand for the... She, she was in love with him. And Cecile Jensen, worse than any... The big smiling male in the middle of a woman's college. What he teaches isn't important. But every one of them, every one of them, every one he preens in front of, he goes into making them fall. I've never so much as looked twice at this girl. She knows what I don't know. You've looked twice at plenty of the others. Be quiet, will you? I'll see you alone for a few minutes. And whatever it is, that might explain the terrible thing that you've been the cause of today will disappear in a pink cloud. Stop it! Stop it! I can't stand to hear you fighting like that. It, this chimes. Two o'clock. Only two o'clock. Mr. Valentine, I, I do know something that might help. But I'm afraid I, I would rather tell it to the professor first. George. Yeah. George, I talked to the sergeant. Yeah, Brooksy. Every one of the girls has been rounded up. Oh. They're all safe. Oh, thank heaven. <laughs> so that's that. Professor, a person can't be hypnotized unless he wants to be. Isn't that correct? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes. But if we're going to find out what Estella has... And everybody done... in your class yesterday heard that the others were told to do, right? You also wrote it down in notes. Yes, of course. So you... whoever cut the saddle and rigged up the electric wire and fired the shot out here just now would have known what to arrange in advance. There was plenty of time. It's only by luck that they didn't turn out to be murders. Mr. Valentine. Take it easy, Stella. Now, don't be frightened. But what are you driving at, Mr. Valentine? It's also possible for a person to resist hypnosis. You can't be hypnotized unless you want to be. But you could quite easily pretend to be hypnotized. That is possible, isn't it, Estella? I... I, I never don't... Never mind, never mind. Yesterday, the professor gave a cue on which his suggestions would take effect... The campus chimes, ringing 11 or 12 o'clock, whatever it was. Yes, that's right. It was the sound of the chimes. Which but Estella, started. that friend of yours, Maggie, told me that before the chimes started ringing, you said you had to go for a walk and cut your class because Ferris had told you to. It was 11 o'clock. Yes, you knew what you were supposed to do, which you wouldn't have if you'd really been hypnotized yesterday. So you asked her the time. And then because she said 11, you started acting strangely. Which a person acting out of post-hypnotic suggestion also doesn't do. There's no dream, no trance. Oh, Mr. Valentine, Estella just couldn't... I'm afraid she did, Mrs. Ferris. The girl who always had to listen to the other girl's confidences. And they don't really generally confide in another pretty girl. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Stella. But, Professor, you're not much of a psychologist, are you? She's been in your classes four years, and you still have trouble remembering her name. You just now slapped her in the face saying you wouldn't look at her twice. Oh, she kept up a great pose of disinterest. But that shot you mentioned that someone fired That was my her. mistake. Well, Estella, your wild plan to attract attention for once, even with the girls who really were on the smiling list, it scared you pretty badly when it started happening, didn't it? So badly you almost killed yourself. Oh, is that... Or tried to, or had buck fever when you heard us coming. I love him. I love him. I can't help but... You're so mixed up, you don't know what you're doing. But a minute ago, I thought you might be in danger if you went into the other room alone with Professor Ferris. <laughs> you just finally realized what you wanted to do in the first place, didn't you? No. No, no, I didn't. I, I wouldn't. Because it was the other way around. He was the one in danger. Let go of me. Please. I'm sorry, kid, but I have to have that gun in your no, purse. No, no, none of it's true. None of it. I, I did Look out. Look out. <laughs> okay. Nobody's hurt. It's all over. George, that poor thing. And I think Professor you Ferris... You see, Brooksy, Mrs. Ferris was just jealous. Shot her mouth off because that sophisticated pose was a bluff. But he didn't actually do anything. Oh, sure, he was a little blind, a little egotistical. But how could he know what an unhappy, twisted-up little girl Estella was behind the surface? Her uncle should have gotten somebody to help her a lot sooner. Oh, that's right. Well, at least nobody's dead. Whatever happens to her, she won't have murder hanging over her. Oh... What do you say we change the subject, huh? Okay, sure, George. But you know, hypnotism... Oh, would... no, there we go again. George, how do you suppose it feels to be hypnotized? <laughs> how should I? Haven't you ever wondered what... Well, sure, I've wondered about it. Hey, Brooksy, uh, look me straight in the eye. Hmm? What? Yeah, go ahead, that's it, that's it. Yeah. Now relax. Relax completely. That's fine. You're feeling drowsy, receptive. Your eyes are staring straight at mine. Staring. Staring. Yes, George? Well, what do you want me to do now? <laughs> Whatever you want, I feel sort of sleepy. Oh! Good night, Angel. of advice about that big investment of yours, your automobile. The car saver men at Standard Stations and independent Chevron gas stations will tell you this. You can stretch the oil in your crankcase or you can stretch the life of your car, but you can't do both. Now, as a matter of fact, the surest way to reduce the life of your car is to run the oil so long that it begins to do more harm than good. Contamination becomes excessive and the additives have little opportunity to control wear and protect the precision-fitted engine parts from rust and harmful deposits. So, to give your car best protection, have the crankcase drained and refilled with RPM motor oil every thousand miles. Ask for this car saver service at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, where they say and mean, we take better care of your car. <laughs> Tonight's adventure, George Valentine, has been brought to you by Standard Oil Company of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Robert Bailey is starred as George with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Let George Do It is written by David Victor and Jackson Gillis and directed by Don Clark. Virginia Eiler was heard as Estella, Lorene Tuttle as Mrs. Ferris, Larry Dobkin as Ferris, Charlotte Lawrence as Maggie, Jane Webb as Cecile, and Bill Boucher as the groom. The music was composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.
Welcome back. Well, I definitely missed a clue. Um, because I should have n noticed that she re she reacted before the uh, chimes actually occurred. Moral of the story, if you're going to pretend to be hypnotized by a clock, keep your eye on the clock. And of course, she w had to be a little bit unstable uh, to even go through this, because to go through this and do things the way she did it, she had to practically be hit by uh, uh, George Valentine's car. So she kind of took a risk that uh, it would end up uh, hitting her. Interesting uh, use of hypnosis in this plot. We have got some great comments from over on Podcast Alley. Uh, Tiger says, I, I can't get along without my Great Detectives podcast. They are the perfect companion to sewing and needlework. The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio Rocks, uh, and then love these podcasts. And there's actually a question in this one. I really enjoy the shows, even though old time commercials are fun. Uh, did Charlie Chan Mysteries ever make it to radio? Uh, the answer to that is yes, Charlie Chan did make it to radio and actually had quite a few uh, runs. According to uh, John Dunning's Encyclopedia, the first Charlie Chan series premiered as a half hour a, a continuing uh, drama uh, retelling one of the original novels, and that lasted till May of 33. Uh, then it came back as a regular 15-minute serial in September 36, stayed on the air till 1938. Uh, and then it came back to the air uh, in 1944 uh, as a summer replacement. And then it was picked up uh, for uh, by the Blue Network into 1945. And uh, then they uh, went ahead and... Uh, did another series of serials from June to November of 45, and then it came back to uh, uh, ra radio for 30-minute episodes uh, between August and June of 1948. And uh, Ed uh, Bagley, uh, for all the runs outside of the 1930s, was Charlie Chan, except for uh, a period when uh, Francis Ortega took over the role. And of course, Francis Ortega also played uh, Nero Wolf. Ed Begley, of course, is probably best uh, remembered for his role in uh, 12 Angry Men as juror number 10. The big surprise with uh, Charlie Chan is all of that syndication. Really, what survives of the uh, Charlie Chan series is uh, one Armed Forces Radio Services episode uh, from during the, the war, uh, a series of partial, incomplete episodes from the 1930 serial. The best uh, of those is the uh, baffling murder of Colonel Willoughby, of which uh, parts 4 through 7 are available, so you can at least find out how the mystery ends. Uh, outside of that, most of the old-time radio featuring Charlie Chan actually originated in Australia through the Grace Gibson uh, transcriptions. So Charlie Chan is out there, and it's definitely on the list to do. Thanks so much for the question. All right, well, we will be back tomorrow with Sherlock Holmes, uh, and next week another episode of Let George Do It. Remember, we're going to be adding a different show on Tuesday. Rogue's Gallery is uh, done, and next week we start on Candy Matson. In the meanwhile, if you have a comment, send it to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, but from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.